Boy, that Rose video sure was popular. So after I posted that Rose video, I read something really cool. A lady named JC came on and made a comment that I had never heard before, and she even went on to say, I don't know who originally wrote it, but I've heard this, and I always liked it. And I liked it so much, I wrote it down, and I'm gonna hang it on my wall of inspiration. But here's what she wrote. Don't be mad that a rose bush has thorns. Be happy that a thorn bush has roses. So yes, I cut my hair, and yes, I trim the neck beard, and you hear Johnny? Since I posted that rose video a couple days ago, I have gotten inundated with questions about specific details on what I did, and I thought I'd take some time because I want you guys to be successful at this. So today, we're gonna go over all those questions and try to cover all of them so that you guys can know all the little ins and outs about what I did on there. And I'll give you a little pinky update. See, I've got my splint on. I'm being a good boy. So let's start with the questions because apparently I didn't give little bits of information that sometimes I give on other propagation videos. Sometimes as I make these and we go forward, I think, well, I've already talked about that before, so I don't cover that little tiny detail. But a lot of new people coming on here seeing these videos and they go, man, Mike, what did you do here? What did you do there? And I thought maybe I should be covering every little individual detail on every video. Of course, that would have taken a 28 minute video and made it a two hour video. But anyway, in regard to that little point, let's just start the questions off there. So the first question I want to cover is kind of not even really a question, but I feel like I've got to address it because I have one rule for myself on this thing. I've gotten over the years some really negative, nasty comments, and I made a rule for myself to kind of protect me from all of that garbage because yeah, like Ricky Nelson said, you can't please everyone, so you got to please yourself. Anyway, people come on and they say, your video's way too long, dude. This should have been a three minute video. Why did you put all that information in there? Well, I did because then if I don't, I get all the questions about the information and they wish that I would have put it in the video anyway. And so I put it in the video and then you're mad because I, you see my point here? So, you know, <laughs> Ricky Nelson, baby. But I want to make a point about this. All of these big propagation videos I do with the roses and the geraniums and the petunias and all of them where I show you propagating a plant from start to finish over several weeks or months, all of them I have made with the same music soundtrack and in the very beginning I take clips throughout the whole video and I put them into that little music soundtrack and do a little intro. You guys know what I'm talking about. So if you guys don't want all the information, I know a lot of you do, but for those of you who don't, all you have to do is watch a 10 or sec, 20 second intro. That's it. It's all right there. It shows me snip the cutting, stick it in a pot, pull it out. There's the roots. Boom, onto the video. Click off, go to the next video. Go somewhere else. It's all right there in the first 10 or 20 seconds. Oh yeah, the rule is don't engage them. It's not gonna go anywhere good. So the first question we'll cover, and I know I've made a video about this in the past, but for anybody new who's wondering, I get a lot of the question, what type of medium are you using? What are you using to propagate these plants in? And what I'm using is fine fir bark. And I'm going to take you out and show that to you now. All right, guys, so this is my pile of fine fir bark. And let's show you what that looks like real quick here. It's just fine fir bark, finely ground. And the reason I use that is because it's readily available in my area. That's it. When I originally started propagating, I started out using sand and it works really well. But for the rhododendrons, which as you guys know, I'm completely in love with, they really like this fine fir bark to grow in. It's, I don't know what it is about it, but they just seem to grow better. I, I just, they, they love the fine fir bark. And when I end up potting them up into pots, they, they do better. I think it's because partly it drains really well, but it still holds moisture. And so there's, there's plenty of air getting to those roots. There's plenty of moisture getting to the roots. And it's just a perfect symbiotic relationship between rhododendrons and fine fir bark. Now, having said that, I have gone on to propagate everything else that I propagate here with the fine fir bark. I completely got rid of sand because it's just too heavy. It got to be a pain in the butt moving it around, hauling it in my truck, that kind of a thing. Uh, after a while, you know, dead leaves and worms crawl up into it and all kinds of, you know, it just starts getting 
kind of old after a while, and you want to replace it, well, it, you know, it's a job trying to replace sand constantly. But this stuff, I put into my propagation frames, I put into my propagation totes, and then when I'm done propagating, I can reuse this in pots when I'm potting up plants, and none of it goes to waste. It's light and easy to deal with. It's airy. It drains well. It holds a lot of moisture. Now, having said that, let's go talk about what you can do. I live in the Pacific Northwest and not everybody has access to fine fir bark. I get that. Fir trees grow everywhere around here and so it's a huge industry logging and then they just use all the materials from the logging for other things and so I can drive down to any local landscape supply business that supplies gravel and sand and you know all that kind of stuff. They also always supply bark fine fir bark or medium fir bark or coarse fir bark and if you go watch that video I'll put a link up here somewhere to a video I made a couple years ago about what I use and how I actually arrived at using the fine fir bark uh, anyway I actually went to the landscape supply with several uh, pots one gallon pots and a gallon of water poured it in and watched it drain through and I was just testing them all out to see how it would work and which would work better but for you guys that don't have access to it, I started out propagating in sand and it works well and just about anywhere in the country or the world I could imagine you have got access to sand and if you don't have access to that you can use vermiculite, you can use perlite, you can use peat. If you use peat though, always mix that with something that's going to drain a lot better because peat can hold too much moisture unless you get it fully moist and then wring it out real well and it's just very lightly moistened or very lightly dampened but you do, you definitely want whatever you use to drain well some people uh down in the southwest or texas they say you know i don't have any of that bark i don't so you know you guys grow a lot of cacti over there i'm from phoenix originally so maybe they've got uh a lot of potting soil that is for growing cactuses or uh, any other kind of plants that need lots of drainage and I know that I can go down to my local big box store and buy potting soil that is specifically for those types of plants that need a potting soil that drains really well and so you can find something like that but if you guys look hard enough you can probably find a landscape supply store or something in your area where you can buy this stuff in bulk it gets really expensive if you try to buy it online through Amazon in a you know in a 10 inch bag or something like that it just I would not do that and then the one thing you obviously don't want to use is regular dirt or soil because it will hold way too much water it'll get waterlogged and then also it's full of fungi and bacteria and you know it'll just kill the cuttings eventually so let's get on the second question that I've been asked over and over again in this one particular video and that is how often did you water those rose cuttings I'm going to show you right now exactly what I did and how often I did it all right guys, so as a quick little simulation, let's just redo what we did here. So I've got my one gallon pot here. I've got the two liter soda bottle and the fine fur bark in there. And as you can see, there's an area all the way around the two liter bottle, probably three quarters of an inch that is on the outside of that two liter bottle. Now, what I was doing, and I'm gonna show you in just a second here, what I was doing was taking the watering wand when I, I had this sitting out amongst my plants and I just take the watering wand when I was watering everything else and I didn't do this every time because I have to water daily right now in the summer it's just really hot but uh, maybe it was cooler when I first started this project and I think maybe twice a week sometimes in the beginning it was like once a week but as it got hotter it was a little bit more i just take the watering wand just brush over the outside of this and the water would just drip down around the outside edge of this pot here around the outside edge of the two liter bottle and down into that soil so it wasn't actually hitting the stem of the rose cuttings it was just on the outside and then that bark on the inside could soak moisture in slowly and no standing water was just sitting in there or running right past the stems does that make sense but i know what a lot of you are saying now mike you just made a separate video about this subject just a couple videos ago that says quit watering them you're watering them too much and that's true but that point was to be made with the totes because people ask me so often how often i water the cuttings when i have them inside a sealed tote this is totally different this is not a sealed tote. The water runs right through the pot, right out the bottom, 
air can circulate through this thing very nicely that's why it makes such a good propagation setup and the the moisture that the standing water doesn't ever happen it just runs right through the moisture can evaporate over time and if i didn't give it a little water occasionally on the outside edge it there wouldn't be enough it would eventually dry out and so this is totally different than the tote setup you can over water this though and i didn't water too much you just gotta kind of watch it play it by ear and see how the thing looks if you see dry bark around where the cuttings are going into the soil you definitely want to add some water to it but this is not a sealed tote so you can water a little bit more frequently but only if you have a good draining potting soil or a good draining propagation medium so the next question, and I know a lot of you guys know this already, but it was where do you cut the stem on the actual rose bush? So I'm gonna go take you over and we'll look at that now. All right, so if you look at the stem here, you're, the place that you're gonna wanna take a cutting is gonna be right below a leaf node. That branch coming out here with all the leaves has got a little node, and so does every other one all the way up the stem. Those are all little leaf nodes, and those can come out as new branches next year. But you always want to cut, any cutting, not just these roses, right below one of those nodes. Maybe a half inch. I mean, there's no hard, fast rule, but just pretty much right below a node. Because the highest concentration of undifferentiated cells are concentrated in those nodes. And those undifferentiated cells are kind of like stem cells in humans, but they can become roots or leaves or flower buds or anything that the plant needs them to become. That's where you want to cut right below a node. So the next question, what size should the rose cutting be? Well, it should be about pencil thickness, give or take. It doesn't have to be exact. I like to use stems that are slightly thicker, around pencil thickness, maybe even a little bit thicker, but you don't want to use too thin of a stem from it because they're just more susceptible to fungus and mold in my experience. Another big question I have, Mike, should I use bottom heat on them? No! You absolutely shouldn't. We're in the middle of summer. It's in the 90s. Some of you are getting into the hundreds. Bottom heat? Are you crazy? Turn it off. Bottom heat is for winter and late fall and early spring and all those cold times when you're trying to root semi-hardwood and hardwood cuttings. But you absolutely don't want bottom heat right now. You've got plenty of warmth in the ambient air. Turn off your heat mats, get rid of them right now, and wait until winter. Mike, should I root them in a basement? In a basement next to a window? What do you think about that? No, 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 no. Guys, right now you're in the best growing time in the Northern Hemisphere. You've got all this beautiful light outside that can just produce tons of sugars for the plant. And you just need to get them outside and you need a stable environment. Don't be moving them back and forth between a basement or a inside in a windowsill and outside. Put them outside, find a spot that is on the north side of a building where no direct sunlight is hitting it, put it out there right next to your house, somewhere where the sun isn't getting it, and just let it get all of the nice, beautiful blue skylight that is natural, that you don't have to find a window or provide artificial light or any of that. Just put it outside, set it there, and forget about it, and leave it in that nice, stable, beautiful environment to grow tons of roots for you guys. Keep them out of your basement. That's for figs in the winter, guys. So that's it. That's all I got for you. So if you just came here for an update on the rose cuttings and you wanted to see all the little ins and outs of what I do, there you go. You can get out of here now. We're done. But if you want to see a pinky update. So I'm not going to actually take this thing down and show, but I do want to let you guys know who care about this thing. It is in a splint. Obviously, you see me outside of the house. It's in a splint. I'm being a good boy and I'm trying to take good care of it. Now, I did go to my occupational therapy appointment and that was, when was that? Monday, and I saw somebody different and this lady was not as nice. I mean, she was nice, but she beat that pinky up, man. I mean, these people get mean. It's almost like they feed off of this, but she was twisting that guy every which way and it was scaring the heck out of me. But anyway, 
she helped me realize that it really can move around more than I thought. I, like, I was not doing the exercises the way I thought I was supposed to be doing them. I was being way too gentle, just afraid of that tendon popping, but I'm still a little afraid, but I'm trying to do the exercises more. She really beat that hand up for probably a good 20 minutes to a half hour, and it was sore for a while, but anyway... I'm getting my exercises down. I've been going to my OT appointments. I'm wearing the splint outside. I'm being a good boy. This thing's healing up. We're getting there slowly but surely. I think now it's just a head game for me. I'm, you know, coming around to the fact that it's going to be, what do we have now? Four more weeks after tomorrow until I get this thing out of the splint and I'm allowed to actually bend my fingers all the way up. They're still a little swollen. It's amazing. The fingernails are still not growing very well. It just makes me think that blood flow is not as good in there. Um, I've still got a, some numbness on other fingers that I'm dealing with, but I think that's a part of the healing process. I don't know. It's getting there slowly but surely though. It's healing. Uh, I don't know what else to say about it. It's just like I said, it's a head game. I've got to get used to the fact that here we are for four more weeks, but I'm really looking forward to getting past that, getting this thing off, and being allowed to actually open my hand all the way again. It's amazing the things that you take for granted. I'm just really looking forward to that, being able to pump my fingers in and out and get some blood flow to them. So that's coming in four more weeks, and then I think they actually want me off of work for another six weeks. I counted forward from what they were showing. It's like another... It's another four to six weeks beyond that point of actually doing more hand therapy and getting my hand to work right again. I Now that I can curl my pinky in with the exercises, I tried doing that and then writing with my right hand the other day, and the other fingers are so deconditioned. I, my writing with my right hand actually looked like my left hand. Oh, speaking of the left hand, I've got a story for you guys that want to hear it. It's kind of funny. It's actually, it's a little bit like, what in the heck is going on with this guy? But anyway, so I was over at my mother-in-law's house, and it was a week after the surgery on the weekend, and my sister-in-law, brother-in-law, and their kids were there too. We were all just picking raspberries out in grandma's garden. And how many fingers is that? That's like, I don't know, there must have been like 50 fingers at the show, right? And of all the fingers there picking raspberries, the yellow jacket chose to sting my left thumb. You guys see this? Look at this. It's ridiculous. You see that little dot on the thumb there? Anyway, it's been almost a week since that happened now, but right after it happened, and I'm not allergic to bees or yellow jackets or any of that, it just hurt like heck, man. That whole thumb swole up so bad, and it started moving through my knuckles and into this part of my hand, I couldn't use my thumb it wouldn't even bend it was so swollen and tight and painful for about a day and a half i started thinking god are you trying to tell me something all i'm doing is picking raspberries i mean what gives it was kind of funny it was kind of crazy though both hands were out of commission for about a day and a half but anyway i've got my thumb back i just thought that was a little funny story and you guys, we really are not guaranteed anything. We really are not guaranteed anything in this life. You can't take any of it for granted. Anyway, I hope you guys are having a fantastic week. I know I am. Just chilling out here in my nursery, enjoying the day, enjoying time with my kids, enjoying time with my wife, my family. I hope you guys are as blessed as I am. Have a fantastic week. If you like the video, like it. Subscribe if you want to follow along. We'll have some more videos coming. I'll see you guys in the next video. Adios. Look at this, guys. It's only been 15 minutes since I showed you this part of the video. But that bark I got from outside, it was dry. It was hot. It had barely any moisture in it, I thought. And here we are just 15 minutes later. This thing's been sitting here. And look how fogged up that bottle is getting. I'm telling you, even with the cap off, it's already fogging up inside. Look at the moisture buildup. It's just a perfect setup, guys. I don't know what to tell you. It's just a beautiful, beautiful setup. And I probably could have gotten away without ever putting water in the thing the whole time the rose was sitting there rooting.